we're told in the Bible that there is representation, that every man is represented in history and in eternity, either by the first Adam or what Paul called the last Adam, Jesus Christ. You are represented in a court of law. And the doctrine of representation is an inescapable aspect of all of Christian life and non-Christian life. The biblical doctrine then says it's either Christianity or humanism, it's either Adam or Christ. But you have to have those who represent you in the same way that David fought Goliath. They fought as representatives, and the victory of the two would represent the victory of the two armies. That was why the Scopes trial was the crucial event, for in terms of representation, you had the most articulate representatives of the rival views. You had William Jennings Bryan, a lawyer. You had Clarence Darrow, a lawyer. And you had H.L. Mencken, who was an extraordinarily gifted journalist. And it all came together in the little town of Dayton, Tennessee. But the question really needs to be answered, how did they get to Dayton, Tennessee? Why was this issue in 1925 such an extraordinarily powerful issue that the media could make it into what did become the trial of the century? So I want to go back. Historians always like to go back, so I got to go back. And I'm going to go all the way back to Isaac Newton. In the battle between the worldview of Christianity and the worldview of humanism, what I would call the worldview of God versus the worldview of man, and as to who is God in that worldview. The battle of the person who denies the influence of God is made in two forms, and we have to recognize both forms. One is what is associated with Newtonianism. He was not a Christian, he was a Unitarian. And he believed that the world was created by a sovereign God and that it was set up to operate in terms of laws of the universe and that those laws were self-sustaining once God had created them. Most of the time they were self-sustaining, but he did believe that God had to intervene from time to time to get the system back in order. He argued that in 1686 in the Principia. By the time of his death in 1727, his own followers were trying as best they could to get God out of the equations. They wanted the system to be autonomous. And the Newtonian worldview, which was basically developed by his disciples, who were committed to a kind of philosophical atheism, became the model of modern science, at least with respect to physics and astronomy. It was a machine, a gigantic machine, predictable in terms of the movement of spheres, predictable in terms of the attraction of mass. It was a machine. Now, if there is a machine, you don't need God to run it. So that enables you to get God out of the picture. You, are, you push God out of his universe by means of natural laws that are autonomous. And that has been one of the strains of atheism ever since. Man as part of a machine. Now the, the hard sell about that is then man becomes a cog in a machine. And most men don't want to be thought of as cogs in a machine. So the other way to get God out of the universe is by means of some form of evolution some form of change, a process of change that does not involve the intervention of God, so that over long periods of time, the universe autonomously brings forth new species, new forms of life, or in fact, in, at one stage goes from non-life to life. Somehow it does that. It's not a machine, it's an organism. And it's much easier for most people to understand organisms, life and death, than it is to understand the machine. 
And most people tend to say, I want to think of myself as being part of an organism rather than just being part of a gigantic machine. Both of them are inherently atheistic because both of them deny the providence of God. Both of them deny the law of God. Both of them deny the creation by God in the modern form. There has been a war in the West between those who are essentially Newtonians and those we would call Darwinians. We need a little of the background, and this is not usually taught, but it's widely understood at least within those who understand the history of uh, Western political thought. The Newtonian view was dominant in Scotland in the mid-18th century. And the Newtonian view was that the world basically is mechanical, it is predictable, you can study mathematics, you can understand the world around you by a careful study of mathematics, that the world is closer to a machine than it is to an organism. There were two men, oddly enough, both named Adam, the two Adams, who promoted this philosophy. One, lesser known, was Adam Ferguson, the other, widely known, was Adam Smith. And the position of the Scottish philosophers, and especially political philosophers of the time, was this. They wanted to explain how did order come about in social affairs unless there was a God who was predestinating it and giving guidance to it. And they didn't want that position. Now, they'd grown up in Presbyterianism, both of them. The Scots grew up as Presbyterians. They grew up with the doctrine of providence. They grew up with the doctrine of predestination. They grew up with the concept of the decree of God. But they were in rebellion against that position. I think, basically, they were deists. Now, it wasn't that they didn't believe that God didn't exist. They did believe God existed. David Hume probably didn't, but the two Smiths did. They wanted to explain the world in terms of man's actions instead of God's actions. And Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations is the most powerful defense of that position ever written, and it changed the thinking of millions of people. He said, following Adam Ferguson, that the individual seeking his own self-interest in a competitive market will produce through profit and loss a system of orderly production in which nations can get rich. He called it the natural system of production. In other words, you leave men alone, laissez-faire. You let them work out, as we would say as Christians, work out their own salvations with fear and trembling. You let them pursue their own self-interest, and through open competition of everybody pursuing his own self-interest, social order arises and develops over time. This is a form of social evolutionism. It was the most powerful form of social evolutionism in Anglo-American thought for at least a century. And so, Smith wrote a book called An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. We know it as the Wealth of Nations. And it was in favor of private property, in favor of the free market, in favor of competition. Fine. Most of us know at least something about that story. What we don't know is that there was a rival who appeared almost a few, just a few years later, in 1793, a radical by the name of William Godwin, and he wrote a book called Political Justice. He was anti-private property, completely opposed to it. He believed in the predict perfectibility of man, that man would advance, but not through private ownership. Man would have this tremendous advance in history by means of his own creative thought and his, and his own political mobilization. He was a radical, no question about it. And there was a man, a parson, a, who was also a self-taught economist who didn't believe Godwin's position. His name was Robert Malthus. And in 1798, he wrote what was basically a response to Godwin, but he wrote it anonymously because of the controversy he thought it would create. It was called an essay on the principle of population as it affects the future, and specifically the future improvement of society. Now, it's known today as an essay on the principle of population. 
but it was geared to the future improvement of society. And he came to the conclusion that there could not be extensive improvement in society because of population growth. That there would always be population growth which would overwhelm any productivity which had preceded the population growth. And the problem was is that he had approximately 3,500 years to 4,500 years of recorded history to prove his case. That had always been true in the history of man. Always been true. Now, it wasn't going to be true in Israel if they followed the law, and you can read the background on that in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. But historically, Malthus had history on his side. What he didn't see was the Industrial Revolution that was about to take place based on an Adam Smith view of the world, of competition and capital investment and technological development and all the extraordinary things that took place in the 19th century which completely changed the world which men had grown up in. He saw overpopulation as the means by which the unprogress of man would dominate and he was wrong. Over 50 years later, two men began thinking about Malthus and his theory, which had come, you understand, which had come in, re in response to political debates. And he was, an, he was an economist. Two men began to think about Malthus. One was Charles Darwin, and the other was Alfred Russell Wallace. They didn't know each other, they had communicated in the mid-1850s, they were on other sides of the planet. And both of them came to the conclusion that the theory of Malthus on the vast expansion of population could provide a means of explaining how certain groups survived. And certain groups survived because they could compete in this highly competitive environment when food ran out and space ran out. And because of certain advantages that some of them had, that those advantages would give them a greater ability to compete for survival in a world that had no God. Now, Darwin wasn't willing to say that initially. And in fact, Wallace never did say it. But that was the implication of the position. Darwin and Wallace came up with an explanation of change, of environmental change, and supposedly a theory of the change of the species based on Malthus's vision of a world of limited resources and massive population growth. And because Wallace came up with it first and had written Darwin, in 1857 about it, it panicked Darwin because Darwin had been afraid to go into print with his book. He'd been working on it for years and it forced his hand. And some of his friends got together and said, why don't you do a joint publication in a scholarly journal announcing the discovery? And Wallace was happy to do it because Wallace wasn't famous and Darwin was a naturalist and was somewhat famous, respected. So Wallace agreed to it and they published in the Journal of the Linnaean Society, and the article sank without a trace, had no impact whatsoever in announcing this new theory. Darwin then really went to work. He wanted to get the book out. His, uh, his publisher wanted to write a book on pigeons, thought that would sell. Darwin didn't want to write a book on pigeons, so he wrote a book. The original title was crucial, and the original title has been suppressed. The original title was On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. I'll tell you one thing, that wouldn't have made a really good ad. He wasn't, he wasn't real strong on marketing, but it got the idea across. And the idea amazingly enough, sold pretty well. It was released in November of 1859, 1,250 copies, and they all sold out in one day. They sold mainly to bookstore owners, people who would market the book, so it had to go back into print. 
you would think in terms of the impact that book had, it would have sold an enormous number of copies. It really didn't. By the time of his death in 1882, it had sold only 24,000 copies. But you don't have to sell a whole lot of copies if the right people read the copies. And what happened was one of those peculiar events, and I would have to say it was providential, that the book was sent to a reviewer of the most prominent paper of the time, the London Times, and the reviewer looked at it, and what reviewers almost never do, the reviewer sent it back, said, I'm not qualified to review this thing. So the editor, book review editor, had to do something. So he sent it to somebody else. He thought, well, maybe this guy can handle it. And the guy he sent it to was Thomas Huxley. Huxley read that book and was transformed. Huxley then became the greatest promoter of Darwin in that first 25 years after, after the publication of, of Origin of Species. He became known as we know him today as Darwin's Bulldog. I want to analyze the title because analyzing the title is going to tell you a whole lot about the book. First of all, natural selection. Now what did that mean? The model that Darwin used repeatedly in the book was of the breeding of animals. That's fine. There is breeding of animals. They don't change into another species, but within a species there is certainly breeding. But there are breeders. And the problem for Darwin was, how do you get away from a providential view of the world? How do you get away from an evolutionism, an earlier evolutionism, which has design of some sort, which has final causation? In other words, how do you get away from providence in discussing breeding because it's like, the old, it's like the old Newtonian idea. If you got a machine, who made it? Okay, legitimate question. On the other hand, as it applies to evolutionism, if you've got selection, who was the selector? Who did the breeding? And so throughout the book he says, now I don't really mean this. I, I'm not really saying that somebody did this. But he keeps coming back over and over to selection. And selection screams selecting. And so he had to use essentially a trick. That is to say, nature selects. It is natural selection. Now, where does that go back to? It goes right back to Adam Smith. Adam Smith talked about the natural economy or the natural competition or the natural system of freedom. What Darwin did was to go back to the 18th century social evolutionism of Adam Smith and Adam Ferguson, and he applied that to biological processes. That was the origin of the origin of species. He, in the same way that Adam Smith wanted to get the idea out of the system of a government planning agency which directs the economy, so did Charles Darwin want to get out of his system the concept of a planning god or breeder who directs the process. Both of them had the same goal. How do you explain order without appealing to an individual to supply that order? So he used selecting or selection, which is the language of purpose, in order to defend an attack against the idea of purpose. Now the second phrase, favored races. Now is that a ringer or isn't it? What do you mean favored? Favored implies favor. Do me a favor. Do I have your favor? Do you favor my goals? When you say favored, passive tense, it implies a favorer. So how does a system which has no God, has no plan, has no future, has no future orientation, has only completely natural processes, how does that favor anything or anybody, especially races? And that language didn't change. It is the language of assessment and reward. And it is also, by saying races, it is the language of genetic grouping. And that became the hook. And this is what has been pushed down the memory hole. It is the inherent racism of the system that was basic to the spread of the idea of Darwinian evolution. It was one of the most important aspects of it. 
it was a recapitulation of the right-wing enlightenment of, of Scotland. It was purposeless, a purposeless system, a planless system, but it would provide order. Now the first real genius to pick up on the meaning of this was Darwin's first cousin, Francis Galton. He was, a, he was really a half-cousin. And he began to see a problem if this was all true, and the problem was charity. If we give charity to an individual who is sick, weak, or whatever, you are, you are in effect pushing for the survival of the less fit. How is that going to lead to competition? How is that going to lead to the breeding, and it was breeding, of an effective, efficient race? And he began to question it. And you can find a footnote to his 1865 article. Uh, you can find a footnote in Darwin's 1871 book, The Descent of Man. Now, in that uh, system that, that Galton came up with, he had the idea basic to it that there had to be competition of the races, there had to be some means of one race advancing the species known as man. He wrote a book called Hereditary Genius, and it was a genius piece of work, much more genius than certainly than Darwin's works. Uh, he, ca he came up with the idea that we call today regression to the mean. Uh, he was a statistical genius. And in the 1892 edition of the reprint of Hereditary Genius, which came out in 1869, here's what Galton said. And this is an extraordinary statement, and it set the pattern for the next almost half century. He said, The natural ability of which this book mainly treats is such as a modern European possesses in a much greater average share than men of the lower races. There is nothing either in the history of domestic animals or in that of evolution to make us doubt that a race of sane men may be formed who shall be as much superior mentally and morally to the modern European as the modern European is to the lowest of the Negro races. He called this system eugenics. He gave that name to it in 1883. He coined the name eugenics. It meant racial planning. It meant a means of stopping the reproduction of those races that were less advanced, that were lower in this scale of humanity. In Darwin, in 1871, this was before Galton had been so open about it, we find a similar statement. Darwin said the following, by the way, footnoting Galton's 1865 article, with savages, the weak in body or mind are soon eliminated, and those that survive commonly exhibit a vigorous state of health. We civilized men, on the other hand, do our utmost to check the process of elimination. We build asylums for the imbecile, the maimed, and the sick. We institute poor laws, and our medical men exert their utmost skill to save the life of everyone to the last moment. There is reason to believe that vaccination has preserved thousands who from a weak constitution would formerly have succumbed to smallpox. Thus, the weak members of civilized societies propagate their kind. No one who has attended to the breeding of domestic animals will doubt that this must be highly injurious to the race of man. It is surprising how soon a want of care or care wrongly directed leads to the degeneration of a domestic race. But excepting in the case of man himself, hardly anyone is so ignorant as to allow his worst animals to breed. Now, this is Darwinism. This is original Darwinism. This is dog-eat-dog -dog Darwinism. This is, in the old phrase, the Darwinism of nature read in tooth and claw. It is vicious, it is racist, and it would catapult man, the planner, 
man, the breeder, into a position that previous societies would have said only belonged to, the God, to God, to the right of God to make decisions like that. But Darwinism, having, having pushed God out of the origins by means of enormous amounts of time, and having pushed God out of the process of the development of species, Darwinism then said, who's left? And by default, man is left. And years later, in his, in his book on the abolition of man, C.S. Lewis got it right in one brief sentence. When you hear that man has got to take control of man, that means that some men have got to take control of all the others. And that's the heart of it. In 1883, there was a division within the Darwinian camp, and it was, a, it, it was a division which split American politics. A man named Lester Frank Ward wrote a book called Dynamic Sociology. He was a genius. He was a self-taught man, an expert in about five different fields. He was a Darwinian to the core, but he began to change the terms of the debate. He had a hatred of Christianity. He had a hatred of what I like to call right-wing Darwinism. In other words, the man competing one against another in order to raise the species, which had been picked up by defenders of the free market to justify capitalism. Because you want total competition because you want the best man to win because that's Darwinian. And the phrase, the survival, the survival of the fittest, doesn't come from Darwin. It came from Herbert Spencer, who coined it several years before Origin of the Species. And he was a convert to Darwinism, but before that he was a great defender of the completely unhampered free market. And he loved competition, and he saw Darwinism as a means of defending uh, unrestricted competition. Lester Frank Ward hated Herbert Spencer and everything Spencer stood for. He changed the nature of the Darwinian debate. Here's how he did it. He said, with man there has been he didn't use this language, but the meaning of it was a leap of being. There has been a great advance because of the mind of man. What man has that previous species did not have is an understanding of the Darwinian laws of evolution. And therefore, scientific men who can understand the laws of Darwinism can then apply these laws to begin to reshape society. He is known as the father of American central planning. Lester Frank Ward really deserves that title. He was a man who believed totally in the right and obligation of, si of a scientific elite to teach politicians the laws of social development, Darwinian laws of social development, and to take control of the economy and the legal system. And he saw the central institution to do this as the tax-funded school system. And Dynamic sociology is one of the most powerful statements ever made on how the elite can control the flow of information to the next generation of students. At, at first, the book didn't sell well, but within 20 years, Lester Frank Ward was one of the most influential scholars in the United States. He's forgotten now, but for a brief period, he was tremendously important, and his idea spread very fast to the elite. His idea was the central planning of the, of the economy, and that was picked up with Galton's idea of the direction of genetics by means of scientific planning. Both required scientists, both required the power of government, both required some means of taking political control of the direction of government. In other words, it shifted from open competition to directed competition, directed evolution, lo and behold, we got the breeder, lo and behold, we got the planner, lo and behold, we are back to where we were prior to, to Adam Smith's view of the open competitive market. So you had two debates within Darwinism. First of all, you had purposeless conflict, which leads to progress. That was original Darwinism. Now, after the 1880s, you had a new view, scientific planning leads to progress. Both Darwinian, both atheistic, both committed to progress, both determined to keep Christianity out of the debate. Here's what you did not have 
1885, and 1900. You did not have debate over the following. There is a hierarchy of races. It is an intellectual hierarchy. It is a moral hierarchy. Notice, it's not necessarily a biological hierarchy. It has to do with culture. It has to do with IQ. It doesn't have to do with anything else. Now, the guy who knew that was fake was Wallace. Wallace smelled a ringer on that one. He knew that was fake because he said the mind of man is some great evolutionary leap, that, you, that, the, that the IQ of somebody in some backward area, you have very brilliant people all over the world, and evolution can't explain why there should be this enormous increase of the power of the mind of man compared with all other animals. And he became a spiritualist. He wouldn't buy into the atheism at all. But nobody paid much attention to him. Within the debate, Within Darwinism, in other words, within the camp of the, what we might call the camp of the unfaithful, there was an open rejection of the Bible and everything connected to it. This led to social Darwinism. But social Darwinism, as I've tried to present here, it had two sides. What I would call the right-wing guys, guys like Spencer and, uh, and Sumner, people who defended the free market based on the original Darwinism of dog-eat-dog, and you had the progressive movement, that is, the planners, the guys who took seriously all the business about breeding, all the business about scientific knowledge. And they were at war with each other for the minds of the American people and the American, not necessarily the American people, but certainly the American educated elite. It was the progressive movement of the status, the planners, versus the free market. Both rejected the Bible. Now, within Protestantism, we have exactly the same debate. On the one hand, you have what you probably should be called, although it's premature in 1900, but what we would call fundamentalism. Commitment to the Bible, commitment to the doctrine of creation, commitment to the doctrine of the final judgment, commitment to the idea that God directs the affairs of men, that prayer works, that prayer calls upon a God to intervene. Galton had spent a whole chapter saying there's no statistical evidence that prayer changes anything. He understood what prayer meant. He did not want that kind of viewpoint to get any kind of wide, uh, wide acceptance within what he would call the, the educated community of the elite. So you had then within Protestantism on one hand fundamentalism, at the same time you have the rise of the social gospel movement. And the social gospel movement believes that Christianity is mostly about changing society, mostly about getting control of government mostly about taxes and redistribution of wealth and control over the affairs of men's lives. Now, there were some, go, some social gospel men who were believers in the Bible. You could find a few. And you could find some fundamentalists who believed that government ought to intervene in the economy. And the most famous of all the fundamentalists who believed that was William Jennings Bryan. And there was a movement called populism that was basically a rural movement and farmers organizing to get certain kinds of government controls over the uh, markets for grain and other, other uh, agricultural produce. And so there were radicals who held to a fundamentalist view, and there were social gospel people who believed in the Bible, but on the whole, the fundamentalists believed and did believe at the time that government was not to be trusted, that the educated elite out of Harvard and Princeton and Yale were not to be trusted. Certainly Harvard and Princeton, Yale didn't really go liberal until Woodrow Wilson took over in 1902. But they didn't trust all the academic types. They didn't surely trust them if they were critics of the Bible, if they were uh, promoters of the higher criticism of the Bible, and surely they didn't trust them if they were Darwinists. So you have the, the same kind of fight, the division that you have within social Darwinism between the planners and the non-planners. Uh, you have the same kind of fight within Protestantism between the social gospel people and the fundamentalists. Now, there were no six-day creationists, or if there were, they haven't left any record. There was no institutional defense of anything that we would call the six-day creation. But nevertheless, there were men who understood that God had created the world, even though Maybe he did it in age-day system, or maybe he did it with a gap system, but there was no question in people's mind that God was the creator. 
And William Jennings Bryan was the articulate defender of exactly that position. This takes us up to about 1900. The difficulty that we have in tracing the history beyond that, it does get very complex. The battles get very subtle. Battles from one denomination to the next between the modernists and the fundamentalists or the more conservative people. Uh, the, the battles begin to shape uh, American Christianity. There's no question about it. What we find after 1900 is that the intellectual elite begins going more and more in the direction of Lester Frank Ward and the idea of central planning. The government has got to intervene to direct the economy. That becomes the viewpoint of at least the educated elite that, that wants to uh, extend scientific planning and scientific thinking into the realm of politics. Now they're not all socialists, I'm not saying that. Some were, most were. They were interventionists, they were what we call progressives. And they generally, as I've said, they were not great believers in the Bible. The issue becomes increasingly, after about 1905, the issue becomes eugenics. And the elite members of what we might call the intelligentsia begin to move in the direction of Galton and the eugenics movement. And their belief is the lower classes reproduce too rapidly and the upper classes tend to limit the number of children. The upper classes had the advantage of birth control methods and the lower classes did not. And this they saw as a threat. And you began to see books and materials on how the great race, meaning Nordic, Anglo-Saxons, was losing out to the lower races. And these would be Africans, Southern Europeans, Japanese, these lower groups, especially because so many of them were coming into the United States because there was open immigration. And millions of them were coming to take advantage of the tremendous opportunities here. There was freedom, there was growth, there was prosperity, there was a way to get ahead. America really was the promised land. And they wanted to get a piece of the action, and who could blame them? But as they begin to stream into the cities, the elite who could previously control the outcome of politics began to lose that control, especially in the eastern seaboard. And the Irish, who were great political organizers, began to take over uh, the, the administration of public affairs. And so you began to see books like The Passing of the Great Race. And these books were not written by guys running around in white sheets with pointed hats because the Klan was basically gone by then. Klan's revival took place in about 1815, 16, that period. In this interim period, Klan was almost non-existent anywhere in the North. These were leaders. The Carnegie, found, the Carnegie money began to go into the eugenics movement. Some of the most important intellectual leaders and professors in the United States were great defenders of eugenics. They didn't know exactly how to pull it off, but finally they caught on. Forced sterilization. And the first forced sterilization law ever passed in the United States was in the state of Indiana, not deep southern culture, which would not tolerate it at that point, but Indiana. And they began to kill, or effectively kill, the reproductive organs destroy them, cut them out, of people who were regarded as mentally inferior. And this began to spread. And they like to tell us that it didn't spread too long, but it spread almost to the beginning of, of the uh, post-war period after World War II. And some of those laws were still on the books into the 1960s. There's never been a detailed study of how many were killed, not killed in terms of executed of adults, but killed in terms of reproductive facility, capacity. Uh, th they killed their heirs, they killed the offspring, and they did it systematically. And we know it was tens of thousands. Now Hitler came in in the 30s and immediately picked up on this. And those laws began to be passed by 1935. And in some cases they were taken right out of American legislation. 
Now, Hitler was a lot more serious about his use of genetic engineering. They used, I mean, he, he brought in IBM uh, computers to do it. One of the earliest uses of social planning was Hitler's use of the IBM computers uh, for the purposes of finding genetic background on individuals and sterilizing them. And there's pretty good evidence that they did more than sterilizing the unfit. They killed them. That was not done as far as we know in the United States. But, but eugenics was such a powerful force in the thinking of the upper classes that they were, they were really afraid of democracy because the lower classes, the unfit by any other standards, were gaining control over the ballot box. And Brian was their representative and they were afraid of it. And they had reason to be afraid of it if you think immigrants are substandard or too far down on the human chain of competence. And so eugenics was powerful. You can find now, you can go onto the web and find it. Google has opened this up. You can, you can read about compulsory sterilization because of Wikipedia. And you can read about the eugenics movement. But as recently as the mid-90s, this story was not widely known and it's never been in the textbooks. It has never been in the textbooks. They dropped this one down the memory hole because it is simply too embarrassing for individuals to believe that the leaders of this country, I mean the intellectual leaders, the, the monetary leaders, the, the people who were the great uh, controllers of capital, were, were absolutely committed to some form of, of sterilization and of race planning. You had Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. You can go and get her book. It's, it went into the public domain called The Pivot of Civilization. It was printed in 1922, just before the war that began in, in uh, Dayton, Tennessee. Yeah, read it. If you think this was not the goal, she wanted Planned Parenthood to stop the reproduction of Irish and other lower class individuals. That was the goal, and she was open about it. And she was not alone. She was not a crackpot. She was able to raise money for the cause. This was a common view, and the man who fought it was William Jennings Bryan. And what happened was, in 1921, Bryan gave a speech, a series of lectures actually, on Darwinism and the Christian view of man, called In His Image. It was published as a book in 22, In His Image. It was a powerful series of lectures, and he went to the passage in, in Darwin's Descent of Man, where Darwin said charity weakens the race, and he was outraged. And he had never really gotten into this fight before, but he realized that was opposed to everything he believed in. It was, it was a belief that we should not help our fellow man, that there was something wrong with charity and assistance. And he began then to preach it. And that was what got him into the fight in the public schools over not having Darwinism taught in the schools. He believed that the left, we would call the humanist left, he believed that they were using the public schools and tax money to promote a view of man which he believed was demonic and said so. And so when he began going to legislatures and when he began going to the public saying we've got to have laws against this, he set himself up for the fall. He made himself the lightning rod and it was self-conscious. He knew what he was doing. He was a great speaker. He was a great organizer. He was widely respected. He had the mailing list. He knew his audience. He knew Christians could not tolerate this view of humanity. He did not believe in eugenics, obviously. He was a Christian man, and he knew this was a war for the hearts of the people. And he knew that the battlefield was the public schools, that money was being taken from Christians. Money was being taken from Christians to promote this view of life. And the, and the, doc, the document that promoted it openly was a book called A Civic Biology, published in 1914, and it was that book, racist to the core, 
that was used in Dayton, Tennessee during the week that John T. Scope served as a substitute teacher. That was the war. That was the road to Dayton. It was a road based on the intellectual elite of the United States which was committed to a form of racism which went so far as to say we've got to sterilize people and they got legislation passed to sterilize people. Over half, over half of the states in the United States in 1956 still had the compulsory sterilization laws on the books. Over half. Now they weren't being enforced but they'd been on the books for years. This was not some minor movement. William Jennings Bryan wasn't taking on some obscure group of intellectuals. He was taking on men who controlled the legislatures of this country. They had to stop him. They stopped him in the initial stages in that series of articles published in early 1922 in the New York Times in which they savaged him. These men, they were eugenicists and they savaged him and they savaged all the people he represented. The ignorant fools, as Mencken called them, the bourgeoisie. And they savaged these people because they were Christians, because they didn't have sophisticated educations, and because they wouldn't sterilize people who didn't meet their standards. And that was the road to Dayton. That's why it was a showdown. The intellectual elite of this country, of the United States of America, knew in 1925 they had to take Bryan out. And in the court of public opinion, though not in the Dayton court, they took him out. He died five days later and left the fundamentalist movement without a movement, really, an organized movement and without a leader for at least the next 30 years. That was the story leading to Dayton. It was not about the smart, rational people of science versus the poor, ignorant fundamentalists who couldn't make it into the 20th century, except insofar as poor, ignorant fundamentalists knew that you didn't sterilize a woman without telling her that that is what you had done so that she could not reproduce. And within two years, that went to the Supreme Court of the United States in Buck versus Bell, and the court decided it was legal and constitutional to sterilize these people. And in the famous line of the most committed evolutionist on the court, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., three generations of imbeciles are enough and only one man on the court voted against it. Within two years of Dayton, this country authorized the compulsory sterilization of women without their consent, without their knowledge, to stop them from reproducing. This was a fight for the heart of America, and the fight still goes on. We hope that we can win this fight in our day. And if you are in, in any way interested in this story, if you have any skills to get in this fight, if you want to study the road to Dayton in greater detail, if you want to make certain that this kind of false, false advertising, which is what the story of Dayton is in the conventional press and in the textbooks, if you want to stop it, then I encourage you to do what you can to commit your life to getting on board what is clearly and has long been a political fight. It is a life and death fight. It is the kingdom of man versus the kingdom of God. And there are no neutral positions anymore. Since 1925, there's been no room for neutrality. This was a fight. I think it cost Brian his life. It certainly cost him his reputation. He fought the good fight as best he could. I think we can fight it better. We surely are not hooked in by the age day view of origins. Six day creation gives us a, a basis of fighting far superior than what Brian had. If we can do better than Brian, we should. We've been given the tools to do better than Brian. And Jesus was clear.
in Luke 12, 47 and 48. Uh, if you have your knowledge, you have greater responsibility. This is a life and death fight. It involves your commitment. And I would strongly encourage you to follow that commitment in whatever capacity you have, with whatever skills you have, to make certain that we never again get back on the laws and the law books of this country or whatever country you're in. The right of the state to sterilize women because they are of the lower sort. Because that is Darwinism to the core. That is where it leads to and that is why we have to fight it.